Um, but one of the stories in the book also which I, I loved was the one of how back in 1985 you set up Discovery TV, which was the first independent TV station in the Caribbean island of Granada. How did that happen? And what was the best thing that you did with that venture? Oh, that happened because, you know, Ronald Reagan had invaded Grenada. Um, there was a coup d'etat down there. He had invaded Grenada. And um, um, I went down there thinking that maybe I could, I could um, pick up some construction work um, down there. And when I got there, all the big contractors were already there. And I was way out of my league, and, and, and that didn't happen. But what did happen was I met a man that was running for uh, a prime minister. He was the interim prime minister. And we became fast friends. And um, he had mentioned to me once that they, the uh, TV station had got bombed and they didn't have a TV station. And I said, oh, we can, we can rebuild that for you if I get a license. And um, I got a license. Uh, on the spot to build a TV station. Of course, I didn't know anything about it. So I came, I came back and I said to my cable TV engineer, a very, very smart man by the name of Mike Adams, who I just got off the phone with before this podcast, who I've been, been with him for 30 years. And I said, Mike, I got, you know, good news and bad news. And I said, you know, we didn't get any construction. We didn't get anything we understand, but we did, we do have a TV license <laughs> to figure out how to build a TV station. And, um, uh, I said, you know, why don't you come come down with me and we'll figure it out. He said, I'm just, I promised my wife I'd take her on vacation. I said, no, 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 bring her to Grenada. It would be great. And he brings his wife, Eileen. And of course, the, the Marines are still there. There's barbed wires on the beach. You know, it wasn't quite the vacation spot that he was expecting. But we built the TV station. And to answer your specific question, what did I learn? I learned, again, through self-preservation of how to get into the cable TV, uh, how to get into the production business. Hmm. We couldn't afford to buy any con con. So we built our own and um, we started, you know, uh, producing content and we won a few awards and then we won a few more awards in the Caribbean. So we started producing content in the States and then we won a dozen Emmys in the States by producing content. Um, so I learned how to produce TV content, which has been a great joy in my life. I did a lot of it, you know, a, 15 years ago, but I'm, I'm getting back into it now because, you know, I miss it and I like it yeah. and it's, it's important. You also, for that reason, I think, set up a mobile broadcast studio in a bus. Were you the first person to do that? I mean, it sounds a wonderful idea. And the whole point was that you could, they could then go everywhere and encourage people to make their own content. And uh, you didn't need to have people visit a, a, a studio, which, as you say, is a pretty sterile environment. I just think that's a, well, that's what, a lovely idea. What happened, Richard, was um, I was going through the budget of our cable systems one day. And, um, and I looked at and each system we owned had about a million dollars a year in the budget for these studios. And I said, why do we have these studios? No one ever uses them. We don't really produce much of our own content. And they said, well, we, in our franchise agreement, we're required to have a studio for any, you know, local people that want to come and, and do a show. And, um, and uh, I said, does anybody ever use them? And they said, no. And I said, well, what happens if, if we took a, a radius of like 100 miles and how many, how many cable systems we own? And if we drop a pin here and we make a circle for 100 miles. And they said, look, in this particular area, there was like seven or eight different cable franchises we had. And I said, that means there's seven or $8 million a year we're spending um, for these studios. I said, what happens if we put the studio in a bus and if anybody asked to use it, we'd drive the bus there. And, um, you know, we built the, the, the bus, which if I remember right, it was like a million dollars to buy the, the, the bus and outfit it to, into a studio. And, and we were saving $7 million a year and everybody loved it and everybody used it. We used to drive it to schools and we'd drive it to sporting events and we'd drive it to high schools and, and, and little kids' schools. And it was great. And then we bought a second one for the West Coast and we had two. And, and they worked 365 days a year. And it was brilliant because politicians would love it. You'd pull right up outside their office and they'd just walk out and they could do an interview right in the bus or you could drive the bus to an event. So it was, it was, it was really, and we could edit, we could shoot, 
edit and, and broadcast right from the bus. It was fantastic. Well, what I like about the story, apart from the fact that I like buses and I like, <laughs> I like the idea of getting out of uh, sterile studios, is that it was driven by cost reduction, but you came up with an idea which was better, much, much better than the expensive solution. And that seems to be a motif that flows through your whole career. And I've, I, I've written a book called Simplifying, which is, you know, that's the whole point. You're trying to do something fantastic on a shoestring uh, because because you don't have a lot of money. I think, it's a, I think it's a great, great theme that comes through the book. Uh, that's terrific, I think. Uh, there's another Wait. story. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, you go ahead, Rich. I, I apologize. Go ahead. No, no, not at all. I mean, another story from the book that I loved was on page 213 when you were in a, a, a studio, actually, with David Faber, the, the CNBC news anchor, yep. and you were chatting about one of his colleagues who shall remain nameless, and you said, she's pretty confident of herself, isn't she? And Faber, you said, growled back, growled back. He said, no introspection, no self-doubt. And one of the themes in my new book is, is that actually self-doubt's very useful. And it's not the enemy of self-belief. It's actually a very useful counterpart, the yin and yang of self-belief and self-doubt. David, do you have self-doubt? And can you think of a time that self-doubt was very useful to you? Well, here's my view on that, Richard. I, I think that you should have self-doubt on your assumptions, but never on your beliefs. Yeah. So you should doubt your assumptions all the time and double check them and triple check them and quadruple check them, but never doubt your beliefs. I mean, you, you've got to, and there's a guy that wrote a book called Success Through a Mental Attitude, W. Clement Stone, a thousand years ago. I was on a charity board, um, uh, for homelessness with him, and he, and he was a thousand years old when I was on the board with him, and that was, 50, you know, that was forty years ago. So I'm sure he he's been dead for for decades. But um, I sat next to him at a board meeting once, and um, and he said something to me which was just fascinating. It stayed with me ever since. While he was talking to me, he dropped a pencil on the ground, and he picked it up, but and he continued talking to me as he was picking up the pencil, and he said. You see how a functioning adults can drop a pencil and bend over and pick it up without losing their concentration. And he said, a little kid, if you drop a pencil, they get down on the floor and they might not come back up for 10 minutes. They'll find an ant or a crumb or something and God knows where they'll go from there. He said, little things like that you can do instinctively. And I said, yeah, what's your point? And he said, take everything that's important in your life and in, in, ingrain it in you so it's instinctive. So you don't have to spend a second thinking about the things that are important. Mm. Your values and your beliefs have to be instinctive. And there's no room for self-doubt because they're, in, they're instinctive. And that way you can use your brain for your assumptions and new information. But the core of your beliefs and the core of, of what you're trying to accomplish is just instinctive and it mm. doesn't move. And that frees up so much time and so much energy in your brain um, to, to, to be able to have self-doubt on your assumptions, yeah. but not on your beliefs. Do you, yeah. you understand? No, absolutely, to... absolutely. I mean, it's, it's all part of getting in the habit of doing something authentic. And that ties into another story, which I very much liked in the book, which, which was when you were an alumni interviewer for Georgetown University, your, your, your old university, you were pretty dismayed at seeing the same sort of people with the same kind of qualifications, the same kind of resumes, the same kind of uh, ambitions, and the same kind of backgrounds. And you came across this guy who said he got up at six o'clock in the morning and before school every day, he bailed hay, he made hay stacks which he then sold and then made a business out of that. And you liked this guy and thought, this is exactly the kind of guy, if we, if we believe in any kind of diversity, we really want to encourage these people to go to university and to come to our university. And they wouldn't let him in because he didn't have the fantastic grades that all these other people who'd been boning up on the, the tests that they had to do and, and who, had, you know, no doubt had, some of them had very good tutors and so on and so forth, had got better grades. So you then wrote to the president of the university to say this, this guy, 
who bailed hay was exactly the kind of guy that they should take in. But you don't say in the book whether Georgetown University changed their mind on the guy. Did they actually take this guy? No, they didn't. And that's a problem that universities, at least in America, and maybe in the UK as well, yeah, definitely. still have. And I'll tell you, what, the, what this coronavirus is going to do, and I talk about this in my book, how the educational system is going to be totally mm. rethought, but it's going to come 20 years earlier than I expected because of the coronavirus. It, it, it's absurd, the advantage that privileged people have in getting into these higher educations, but that's going to be, that's going to be leveled. The, 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 the playing field on education is going to be leveled. The more difficult playing fields to level are our job opportunities in healthcare and, and some of the other uh, uh, some of the other areas, but education is going to be level because these universities are going to become brands more than they are institutions, um, and, and other people are going to figure out how to get their educational material out in high volume, low cost, but instead of low volume, high cost. So that's going to happen. But you still need a high-speed internet cable, and you still need a mentor, and you still need someone who's a rock in your life. You still need someone that can pick you up when you fall down and tell you it's going to be okay. So there's, you, you know, you still need a little bit of, you know, destiny and luck and all those things put in, put in the bag with everything else. Well, I hope someone really does blow up the educational system, I, you know, I'm particularly in the UK where I'm, I'm more familiar with it, but, but also in the US. I mean, I, I went to Wharton and I loved um, University of Pennsylvania and all the rest of it. But, you know, you have to say that these people are living on borrowed time if, unless they change their model um, and that there are better models. And there are better models with people who really need the education more than and value the education more than the you know rather privileged people who are using it at the moment um i loved you just a couple more questions david and then i think i must let you go i loved your summaries at the end of each book you have a little box at the end of each book and there's one summary on page 225 that i think is worth focusing on you say whenever you have a good idea Ask yourself why it couldn't be made 10 times or 100 times bigger. And that's the point we were talking about earlier of, of scalability. But my question to you is this, David. Why do you think so many great ideas are not scaled? And what can we do about that, apart from, I suppose, doing it ourselves? Well, fair. Everyone, everyone um, gives too much credit to um to failure and they're afraid people yeah. are afraid of failing and they're more afraid of failing in a big a big way than they are a small way and they somehow think if they fail in a small way no one will notice and it wasn't it wasn't a failure but a f failure is just a necessary part of of the whole journey yeah. and it's fine it's it's absolutely fine look i've had huge failures in front of in, in in front of global audiences and it's it's not comforting um it's a lousy night's sleep um you know if you read about it in the paper or, or listen to it in, on, on the news but it's if it's if it's not a failure of your beliefs or a failure of your moral compass then it's fine it's just you know a man or a woman trying to make their way in the world and, and they didn't succeed, so they're gonna wake up the next day and try again. If you have a failure of your of your beliefs or your moral compass, that's hard to uh, come back from uh, because people then won't, um, it's very hard uh, to get you know redemption when that happens. But in America, and this is what's lucky that I grew up in America because in America, we love a comeback story. Yeah. It's a little harder if it's around your beliefs. Uh, but if it's a failure of, of just something that um, you tried to do and you, and you didn't succeed and then you try again, they reward you even more the second time or the third time or the fourth time. The more you fail, the more they root for you and they reward you when you do succeed. Now, again, unless it's around, you know, your core beliefs, in which case, you know, you really have to, 
you, you have to do a mea culpa, mea culpa. You really have to stand up and say, okay, uh, my bad. And if you don't do that, they won't support you. And you see that, um, you know, you, 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 you see that with Lance Armstrong, for instance, what, how much trouble he had coming back because he sort of failed around this core, you know, this core, you know, belief of, 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 of telling the truth and, mm. and being transparent. And he just sort of fought it to the end and, and people are, have trouble with that. Yeah. But everything else you can, you can, you can recover from. Yes, I think and, the, and the, prob the, the problem is not so much a failure. It's not even the institutional system, although the American system with chapter 11, etc., is is more favorable than many. It's actually the effect on the individual. I think a lot of people get knocked out of contention when they fail. Instead of thinking, I'll fail better, I'll carry on failing, and then one time I'll have a success. And again, I, I very much like the idea of, of Taleb, who says, actually, what you really need is not resilience, but you need the ability to thrive on failure, to be anti-fragile in, in his phrase. And you think about someone like Abraham Lincoln, who failed dozens of times, or Winston Churchill was the biggest failure in politics for about 40 years, until he got one idea right, which was that the world was going to come to an end unless Adolf Hitler was stopped. And he knew how to stop Hitler. And everyone else said, you know, he doesn't mean what he says. You know, we'd like to close our eyes. We can't have another First World War where the flower of the generation is killed and all that sort of stuff. But when it happened, when he was proved right, when Churchill was proved right by Hitler himself, there was no choice. You know, nobody, the king didn't want Churchill to be the prime minister. The Conservative Party, which had a huge majority, didn't want Churchill to be prime minister. He wasn't sound. He wasn't, you couldn't trust him. And he, he you know, he'd go over the top on all kinds of moral causes and so forth. But there was no choice. You know, either you had to face the fact that the country, that Britain was an empire and perhaps the whole free world was going to be ruled by Hitler, or you had to put Mr. Churchill into number 10. And that was the lesser of the two evils as people saw it. So I think that, you know, I just love this, those stories in business, in politics and all the rest of it, where if people have the faith in themselves to persevere and actually not to be discouraged by failure, but to be so, well, you know, a failure just proves that I'm important. You know, I mean, OK, I didn't come out on the right side of it, but I'm going to have another go and a bigger go and all the rest of it. It's the, it's the mentality that I think of the individual is is primary not so much the circumstances of the, the, the bankruptcy rules or whatever. But I absolutely agree that that is um, one of the most important lessons that I took from the book. Can I close, David, with one of the other refreshing things about your book, which is that family is obviously very important to you. And you don't hide, a, hide that under a, a bushel or indeed under a haystack. And you mention your mother, Catherine McCourt, a few times. And there's three words of hers that you quote her as saying very often on page 155, and they are acceptance, attitude, and gratitude. What do you think she meant by that? And what do they mean to you? Well, she, she used to always say, now this is a woman that, that recently died and, and she was in her 103rd year, and I never saw her get angry. I never saw her cry. I never saw her, heard her say a bad word about anyone. She was an unbelievable rock in my life. And she used to always say to me, look, we're all going to have challenging moments, but you have to accept them. And you, you have to approach it with an attitude of one foot in front of the other and recognize that, that no matter how bad you think you're having it, someone has it worse. Mm. So just accept it and, and have a good attitude and be grateful for what you do have because someone has it worse. So just put one foot in front of the other and always forward. And she had a fabulous attitude. I mean, this is a woman that renewed her driver's license at 100. That, you know, this is the, the, a woman that, that, that you know, when I, when, when I was lucky enough to make a few bucks and I tried to get her a cleaning lady for her, her little house, she said, there's no way. She says, there's no way. Uh, a, it's good for me. It's healthy. It puts my life in perspective. 
Um, it's my exercise. You know, when you get older, if you don't put your own dishes away and clean your own dishes and hoover your own house, then you won't be able to. She, and, and she was, you know, she was just an amazing, amazing woman. And I thought that was an appropriate way to end the book. You know, I, I start the book with, with that, um, uh, that painting uh, that, that found its way from Fidel Castro. But thought, by the way, Fidel Castro didn't give it to me. Fidel Castro gave it to someone else who was killed in a coup d'etat, and then the Prime Minister of Grenada ended up with it, and the Prime Minister of Grenada gave it to me. So it wasn't it wasn't from the dictator's hands to, to mine. It was from the dictator's hands to someone else that was also a dictator who got killed, uh, who then a Prime Minister of Grenada got it, and then, and then he gave it to me um, as a favor. But I start the book sort of uh, with, with, with that, and I end the book with my, my mother who... And that, look, everyone needs a rock in their life. I was lucky to have my mother. Now, you have to, re, you know, I have to replace her with with other people because that's just the way the world works and that's just the way nature works, you know. Um, my mother's moved on, so I have to replace her with, with other people. But it doesn't matter what age you are, you still need a rock in your life, someone that to to help you. It's, it, you know, I was reading a, a book by another, another Brit. I don't know if you've ever read any of Ian Robinson's books. Um, great, great he, he wrote one book called the stress test and the other one's called, I think the winning effect. Yeah. The great book, they're all about how the mind, the mind works, but your mind, you know, gets formed by other people that, that, you, you know, this is why you can take two people that seemingly should be the same and one goes left in life and one goes right. And they basically had the same DNA and they started with, with almost the exact same brain, but it forms and it changes and it adapts based on the people that, that are in your life. And everyone needs a mentor and everyone needs that secret little rock. And, and most people who have accomplished really big things had that in their life. Um, Lincoln had that, who you mentioned. Churchill had that, as you mentioned. And often, historically anyway, because men were out front historically more than women, uh, often that rock was, was a female um, to these historically great men. Now, mm. it'll be interesting to see if men can play that role to all these great women that are coming up now that are going to do great things. It'll be interesting to see if men are, are able to put their ego in the back, in the back pocket and, and support women the same way. Hopefully we will be able to. Um, hopefully we'll be able to, because I have great expectations for my daughter. So hopefully, <laughs> hopefully we'll be able to do that job. Well, that's great. So the family goes on, David. It's been a great privilege to talk to you. Thank you so much. And oh, uh, Richard, my, my pleasure. Let's stay in. Let's stay in touch. I really enjoyed. I really enjoyed your books. So let's let's stay in touch. Oh, I would. I would very much appreciate you doing reversing the favor and 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 actually talking to me about my book. But um, I loved absolutely loved your book. Total rethink. One of the best and most original idiosyncratic books about well business and life. Thank you so much, David McCourt. And uh, I look Thank forward to talking you. to you again before too long. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. My, my, my pleasure.